Hello, everybody. Seeing some folks starting to join. So come on in, get comfortable, get yourselves settled. I'm going to give folks uh, a few minutes to join into the room. So as folks are coming in, go ahead and open up the chat. Say hello, introduce yourself, let us know where you are coming from. And we will get started shortly. For folks who are just joining, uh, everyone's not sitting here admiring my lovely face. Folks are popping in the chat uh, who they are and where they're from. We're giving folks a, a minute or two to join the room so that we can get started all together. So on my end, I'm in Eastern time, it's uh, 3.02. So I'm gonna give folks another minute or so before we get started. Hey, Tanya. <laughs> Feel like we should have some music going here. <laughs> Get us all in the sex ed nerd spirit. We'll work on we'll work on that. We'll have a little a little anthem for all of you for the next one. Cool. So it is 303. And that to me uh, looks and sounds like as good a time as any to dive in. So let's do it. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Really looking forward to getting into this conversation. So if you uh, don't know where you showed up to today, we are sitting here all together for a really, really important and exciting conversation. This session is titled Expanding Evidence, New Methods and Measures on the Benefits of Sex Education. We are expecting a full house today. And so as you join in, familiarize yourself with the space, I'm going to start by introducing myself so that we can dive in to our juicy conversation for the day. So for those of you who I haven't gotten the opportunity to meet yet, hello, my name is Shadeen Francis. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I am a board certified sex therapist, and I am your resident Canadian for the afternoon. I will also be acting as your moderator. So my role uh, in this conversation will be to help facilitate the dialogue Apart from my own professional life and commitments to sexual health and wellness, I'm also sitting here uh, as the PRMA chair of ASECT. Uh, PRMA stands for Public Relations, Media and Advocacy. Uh, so there is a huge overlap in this space. I'm also the co-chair for the upcoming conference where we are diving deeper and deeper into the research and figuring out how we can take action in real time. So again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your curiosity and your wisdom. And I'm really looking forward to us moving this conversation forward. As always, let's start with just a little bit of housekeeping. We'll clean house so that we can get in and make a mess a little bit. So we are using Zoom webinar today. I am sure that many of us have already been in similar spaces, but for anyone who is unfamiliar, it means that all everyone who is an attendee uh, is automatically muted and your video cameras are off. 
So feel free as always to use the chat function. So if there are ways that you would like to engage, that will happen for you in the chat. Uh, and we are expecting and are thanking you in advance for being respectful uh, for in your use of that chat space. For anyone who is crossing respect lines, um, there is a digital moderator who will uh, remove folks from the event. We have probably all been in a space where uh, folks were joining these rooms in, with the intention of being unhelpful and I know the majority of you are not that person um, but wanting you to know that this is a held and a well attended space. So there is a Q&A box so if you have questions uh, especially questions that you would like to submit to the speakers because we will have a full Q&A session towards the end if you would like to submit a question please go ahead and use the Q&A box that way it doesn't get lost uh, in the chat feed and we will do our best to get to as many questions uh, as we can. And if we are unable to respond to your question, please, please, please forward it ahead uh, by email to seekus at info at siecus.org. And so this will, uh, this event will be recorded and be made available to everyone who registered. So if at some point you need to hop out or if you thought you were going to miss something, uh, do not worry, we will be here waiting for you in the recording. So now we get to do more of the exciting bit. I'm going to move into introducing this conversation and our panelists so that we can dive in. But that was the, oh, just kidding. There is another uh, housekeeping note. Anyone who would like ASEC CEs, anyone who is interested in ASEC CEs, please email the society at sexscience.org. I'm gonna pop that actually in the chat for you. Uh, so that if anyone is interested in getting CE credits for your time today, you know where to go for that. Great. So this webinar is a follow up uh, to an earlier conversation that was hosted in February of 2021 by the Future of Sex Education Partners. So that is a collaboration or a partnership between Advocates for Youth, ANSWER, and SECUS, which stands for Sex Ed for Social Change. Uh, and this conversation is in partnership with ASEC, the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, and of course, QUADES, the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality. So in an earlier conversation, the one that I just referenced from February of 2021, there was some research, some pioneering research that was introduced, and this conversation will build off of that, sharing with you some more details about new technical guidance and examples of how entities are advancing efforts to improve the way that we all study sexuality. Now, this conversation, of course, is super timely because as most of us have encountered in our personal and professional lives, we are in a period when reproductive rights and sexual freedoms and access to sex education um, that is intended to create affirming and inclusive learning environments for diversely identified young people are constantly under attack. And that includes all of us who are existing on the front lines of that work. So that includes social administrators, teachers, parents, students, community members, elected officials, researchers, educators, counselors, therapists, et cetera, all working together to find more ways to make data and information accessible and implementable and useful to serve our growing and diverse population of youth. We know that these attacks, these um, legislative attacks, these political attacks have negative consequences for LGBTQ folks trans and gender non-conforming youth, as well as people of color, folks who have lower socioeconomic statuses. But there's little data that really helps clearly reveal the benefits uh, and the resulting attitudes and behavioral implications of teaching the national sex education standards or other social or emotional learning to students. And so that data is so, so necessary for how we can be informed about how we move forward in this work. In addition, as communities are reaching or reacting to these pressures, 
considering that the sort of going standard is abstinence only programs, which we know are not effective for preventing adverse adolescent sexual health outcomes, it's important for all of us, right, administrators, community leaders, et cetera, to have access to timely research and data that documents any potentially adverse outcomes uh, that these shame-based programs fail to really demonstrate. Right? We are needing fact-based, we are needing fact-based research, we are needing fact-based programs, and we need to be able to share these with young people. So in our audience, many of you are government officials, your researchers, academicians, you are all folks who are interested in this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the work that you currently do. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we continue this work moving forward. So I am excited to turn this over to our speakers so that we can get started. In our first session, which we are titling the state of sex ed data in the US, we have one, two, three panelists for you today. The first is Dr. Kathleen Ethier. Dr. Ethier is the director of CDC's Division of Adolescent and Sexual Health, so Adolescent and School Health. Uh, the acronym is DASH, if you're familiar. And this is within the National Center for HIV, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. Her work has focused on developing strategic direction for agency priorities, best practices for, uses of, for the use of data for decision-making and improving program evaluation. Prior to joining the CDC, Dr. Ethier spent six years on the research faculty at Yale studying HIV, STDs, and unplanned pregnancy prevention among women and adolescents. Her research has included psychosocial, behavioral, organizational, and clinical factors related to women's health, maternal health, and adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Our second panelist is Samantha King. Uh, Samantha King, pronouns she her, is the Family Support and Education Specialist at the Gender and Sexuality Development Program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which you might know as CHOP. Through this role, Samantha provides direct resources to families and supports transgender and gender expansive youth in school and community settings. Samantha collaborates with providers to raise their awareness of gender identity and works with, to improve gender inclusivity through trainings and policy support. And your third uh, panelist today for this segment is Christine So Young Harley, who is the president and CEO of SECUS, the Sex Ed for Social Change. And since 2019, uh, Christine Harley has led SECUS to focus on sex education as a vehicle for social change, focusing on the broad benefits of comprehensive sex education. Chris started CKIS with a robust background in public policy, advocacy, and strategic thought leadership with an emphasis on increasing policy advancements for underserved populations. With that, I would like to turn it over to our esteemed panel. Uh, we're waiting for the slides. There we go. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Hi, this is Kathleen Ethier. Um, I'm the director of the Division of Adolescent and School Health at the CDC. Um, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to kind of do two things today. The first is to give you um, some data, our most recent data, um, really highlighting the challenges that youth have faced during the pandemic. Um, and to really give you a snapshot of where students are now, where high school students are right kind of at this, at this moment. Um, but then I really wanna talk more about our comprehensive school-based primary prevention approach to sex ed um, that can really help address these challenges. You will notice 
I'm going to actually talk about sex very little um, because um, as we were finding prior to the pandemic, choices that adolescents were making were, you know, really going in the right direction. Um, and I think <clears throat> um, where young people are right now is, is actually in a very different place. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk today about our Adolescent Behaviors and Experiences Survey. Most of you know us um, as the, the group that does the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And this survey was very similar to that survey. Um, but we did it online instead of kind of in paper and pencil in classrooms. But um, it is a nationally representative survey of high school students, much as the YRBS did. And we asked a lot of the same questions. But we also asked some additional questions on uh, mental health and emotional well-being. And um, we asked questions about experiences that students had during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what we found was that um, while the pandemic has affected all students, um, the experiences of disruption and adversity were not um, experienced by all students equally. And we see disparities in many of the populations that were actually experiencing more inequity prior to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Young people overall really um, have experienced um, the effects of the pandemic and related disruptions to their families and communities. Um, the majority of youth were having trouble with schoolwork. More than half experienced emotional abuse in their home. More than one in 10 experienced physical abuse at home. And nearly a quarter reported hunger due to food insecurity. So really kind of a broad ranging affecting every aspect of their life. Next slide, please. We also saw that students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, and questioning were really disproportionately impact, impacted by abuse in their home compared to their heterosexual peers. And you know, we, um, we were really concerned, those of us who, who uh, focus a lot on this population, were really concerned that um, that was exactly what we were going to see, that young people separated from their communities and separated from their schools where they get a lot of support were going to be at home, potentially with family members who were not supportive of their identities. And that's really what we saw here. So um, students who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual were twice as likely to experience physical abuse at home. Um, and three quarters of uh, students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning experienced emotional abuse at home. Next slide, please. The other thing that we saw in this survey, and this is a question that we had never asked before, um, we asked students about experiences of racism in school, and not just during the pandemic, but um, at any point, um, in order to really understand how perceived racism influences adolescent health and well being. And what we found was that more than one third of students ever experienced racism in school and that Asian, Black and multiracial students were um, most likely to, to report poor mental health and less likely to feel connected at school as a result of experiencing racism. Um, so this becomes really increasingly important as we talk about both youth mental health and what needs to be done in schools to support young people. Next slide, please. So um, we've talked before that um, adolescent mental health had really been moving in the wrong direction prior to the pandemic. Um, and what we saw here was that the disruption and the adversity that youth faced during the pandemic really um, significantly impacted um, in really ways that were not surprising the mental health crisis that was already um, occurring among our nation's youth. Next slide, please. So what we saw in this data was that really um, more than a third of students report, reported poor mental health during the pandemic. Um, nearly half felt so sad or hopeless that they couldn't do their regular activities for at least two weeks during the year prior. These are markers for depression. 20% um, seriously considered attempting suicide. Almost one in 10 attempted suicide. And these numbers are extremely concerning. Um, and um, what we saw were some real disparities um, in this data. Next slide, please. So you will see here that um, students who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning really experience very disturbing rates of poor mental health and suicide-related behaviors during the pandemic. So nearly two out of three reported poor mental health during the pandemic. 
um, compared to 30% of their heterosexual peers, um, and they were more than three times as likely to have attempted suicide. Next slide, please. But there were some really kind of hopeful, um, hopeful sides to this, and and what we were, what we saw in this um, in this data, and also um, uh, it, you will see when we talk about our school-based program is the power of school connectedness. So um, what we mean by school connectedness is feeling uh, feeling close to other people at school, feeling that people at school support you, feeling that the adults in your school are interested in your well-being and in your success. Um, that's what we call school connectedness. And so we included an item on, uh, related to school connectedness in our data. And what we saw was that um, students who did not feel close to people at school, so the, the dark, darker purple, had higher levels of poor mental health and suicide related behaviors compared to those that did feel close to people at school. Um, the, what, what is concerning to us is that um, we saw higher proportions of students who did not feel close to others at school, and we feel that that's primarily due to um, virtual learning. So when this data was collected, there were still many students who were not full-time back in their schools. Um, but the, the protectiveness, protectiveness of connection, protectiveness of school connectedness is really clear in this data. Next slide, please. So we have a lot more that we can do to improve school connectedness. Um, we can support recovery and resilience following the pandemic. The fact that less than half of students felt connected to others at school during the pandemic is really significant. We know what to do to, um, to improve school connectedness, and I'll talk some more about that. We also really need to address racism in schools. Students who experienced racism in school were so much less likely to both feel connected and to also have poor mental health. And so um, if our schools are more toxic for our youth of color, it makes it that much um, more difficult for us to be able to support them and connect them and, um, and positively influence them. We also really need to make schools safer and more supportive for LGBTQ youth. This has been in our, we've seen this in our data for many years and it was like really just right there in the ABES data. Um, LGBTQ students feel less connected to school. When we look at the data more closely, um, uh, by multiple aspects of students' identity. So when we really take an intersectional look, we really see that, for instance, Black um, LGBTQ students, Black female LGBTQ students have the lowest levels of connectedness compared to other groups and are most likely to experience poor mental health. What the take home here is that schools need to be places where young people feel that they belong and that they are surrounded by people who care about them and their success. And while we're here to talk about, uh, about sex ed, for us and the way that we think about sex ed, um, that is an essential component to, um, to really having a comprehensive, effective sex ed program. So um, what works in schools? So this slide is, um, really shows our primary prevention approach um, to school-based sex ed. Um, this is a somewhat complicated, uh, it's a somewhat complicated slide, but what, um, what we do with school districts is we focus on that center, um, that, that center little group there, the health and wellness coordinator. And what we do is we put a health and wellness coordinator in place in a school district. And, and then we give them all kinds of support. So we give them funding for that position. We give them support from technical, um, technical advisors. We give them technical assistance and infrastructure. Um, we advise them about what they should be doing. And then it is their job to get these three strategies, um, which we think of as sex ed, into um, the middle schools and high schools in their district. And that includes um, quality health education, so a curriculum, so a quality sex ed curriculum. And so that's often what you know we kind of usually think of as sex ed, but we feel like it's really important to go beyond kind of just what's included in, in a curriculum. You need those knowledge, you need those skills, but there's really more to do in a school to support students fully. The second leg of our three-legged stool is really linkage to services. And so it's important that we can't just give young people knowledge and skills. We also have to get them to the places where they can get the services that they need. Um, and then there's a collection of things that we think of as safe and supportive environments. And here's where we're really talking about making sure that students 
all students feel safe, but also really focusing on school connectedness. So doing the things that we know how to do to increase school connectedness and um, to make sure that schools are inclusive for LGBTQ students. Those are really the focus of the safe and supportive environment work for us. When we do these things in the schools that take that approach, we find that we see decreases in sexual risk, decreases in substance use, improvements in mental health, decreases in suicidal risk, and decreases in, of experience of violence. Next slide, please. So here, these are some findings from um, some actual evaluation of schools where this approach was put in place versus schools that um, where the approach was not put in place. We saw decreases in the proportion of students who had ever had sex, who had had um, four or more sexual partners, who and who were currently sexually active, right? So, the, so, so we saw impact on some of the really important sexual risk outcomes. However, we also saw decreases in the proportion of students who missed schools because they felt unsafe. We also saw de decreases in the proportion of students who said that they had been sexually assaulted. So we actually had an impact on the experience of sexual assault, which is, I think, so heartening to those of us who have worked in this area and really important. And we also saw reductions in marijuana use. Next slide, please. And in the schools that put these LGBTQ supportive policies and practices in place, we not only saw decreases in depressive symptoms, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, and suicide attempts among students who identified as lesbian, gay, and bisexual, we also saw improvements in mental health and decreases in suicidal thoughts and behaviors among students who identified as heterosexual. So putting these LGBT supportive policies and practices in place protects all youth. And I think in an environment where um, we are struggling to, um, to make the case for why it is so important to, um, to have schools that are LGBTQ inclusive, um, the fact that these policies and practices are so widely protective is incredibly important. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions as we get all the way through. Thank you so much for being here and for being interested in um, the health and well being of young people. Thanks. And I'm actually sorry, I'm going to hand it off now to Samantha King. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here and, and participating in this conversation. As mentioned, my name is Sam King. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, specifically at our program or at CHOP, we have a program, um, the Gender and Sexuality Development Program, where we work with transgender, gender non-binary, um, gender questioning, gender fabulous youth um, and their families, and really just try to help meet everyone where they're at and see what supports um, would be beneficial for the youth who are connecting to us. So we support families who have kids as young as three years old who are starting to talk about gender um, and questioning gender um, up to the age of 22. Um, my role at our program is really to help around education. So I position myself as an education advocate for our families. Um, so really thinking about what barriers um, are existing for our trans and non-binary students to have that connectedness in school. Um, Dr. Kathleen, I wrote connectedness on a sticky note and underlined it so many times because that is such a big um, barrier and challenge for our youth in, in feeling like school is even a safe place for them to be. Um, and I'll talk about what our youth have shared about what they want in their um, in their education. And a big part of that is that connectedness. Um, so we do a lot of education advocacy, professional development for staff, because we also find that majority of staff want to know how to get this right. They want to know what to be doing in terms of their sex education, what things should they be updating, but they just don't have the tools available. Um, and so really thinking about the ways in which people are accessing education. Um, and a lot of our families don't know how to ask for this. And so we can go in and step in and help get those questions in that space. Um, so 
one of the things that I did in preparation for this panel, and this was a really good time for this, is connected to our youth and ask them, you know, what, what's going on for you in terms of navigating sex, sex education? How is it being presented in your classrooms? And to what degree are you able to engage in that education? Um, none of what I'm going to share is probably going to be surprising to many of you, um, but really being able to hear those youth experiences. Um, and so what we what we found from our gender diverse youth in terms of just asking the question, you know, what do you want in your sex education? What would be helpful for you to either learn about or just the ways that you're even engaging in the material? Um, the biggest thing that came up for our youth, um, and we asked youth, you know, some of these um, kids are able to access health and growth and development um, as early as third or fourth grade um, through high school. Um, everybody wants to learn in the same space together. It, continuously, we hear from youth, stop separating these classes based on binary gender. Um, it is unnecessary and there are so many things that impact, definitely impact our trans and our non-binary students. But also when we separate, what sort of um, additional stigma are we contributing to by keeping students away from each other during these conversations, right? That we think only these types of conversations are appropriate to have with this gendered group versus this gendered group. So even thinking about how our cisgender students are engaging with the material, what sort of message are we sending when we separate and prioritize that separation to happen? So getting rid of that binary separation, um, oftentimes when classes are separated by that binary, our trans and gender diverse students aren't given many great options. Um, oftentimes, um, and this just came up recently, um, kids are being forced to participate in a class that aligns with their sex assigned at birth. How schools think they're gonna reinforce this is a little beyond me, but that's oftentimes an option that's given to families to say, your child has to decide which group they're gonna go into. And it's not always the affirming group that the child would choose. Also thinking about our students who aren't out about their gender identity at school and what sort of um, way are we asking them to participate in that education. Um, most unfortunately um, of our gender diverse students choose to opt out of these classes. Um, so that connectedness goes away, right? All of a sudden I am not able to participate in what should be normal access to education, um, a lot of our students just because of the degree of dysphoria, because of the lack of inclusive language that's going to be used in that space, um, choose to opt out. And that often means sitting in a room by themselves um, during those lessons or staying home. And so they lose that connectedness with their peers. They lose that experience um, to be able to be in a learning space. So. That was the biggest priority was just how do we reframe the ways in which everybody gets the same education together in a space. Also wanting um, to prioritize time to help peers understand the difference between sex and gender identity and expression and orientation. It's astounding to me how many curriculum don't have this included. Um, and a lot of our youth are spent spending time and energy in that space, either trying to educate um, themselves, like educate their group on this of like, wait a second, I have to disrupt like what's being talked about because you're not using this language correctly um, or feeling completely excluded from the education that's happening because there's just not a layer of education that's happening for staff to understand the difference between sex and gender, um, to talk about orientation diversity, like all of these things that should be included and primed before we even jump into sex education is just not happening. Um, and then really just needing better inclusive language to be used when talking about bodies and talking about relationships. Um, you know, oftentimes those bodies that body discussion happens in such a binary and we lose the fact that biology is incredibly diverse. We lose you know, opportunities to talk about intersex variations and how our bodies are constructed and reframing the ways in which we attach gender to bodies when really we should be, again, spending that time talking about biology, biological diversity, which is different than gender diversity. Um, so having opportunities 
to talk about that diversity and help increase the awareness um, of our students. And then really just thinking about what's the lens that we're teaching about sex education, constantly wanting to disrupt that heteronormative lens. Um, and again, this comes back to that professional development is needed. We need more staff who are aware, who can see this, because um, a lot of times our staff you know, they look at the curriculum and if they're not super in tuned, if they're not able to attend talks like this and start to add on, I call them gender and orientation goggles, where we can see like what things are missing or what things need to be improved, you know, their intentions might be really great, but they're not able to see it through that lens. And so adding that professional development to be aware of, okay, how can I reframe this? How can I restructure this to take into account everybody in that learning environment? Um, so really being able to utilize our youth, utilize those youth voices to say, this is what we need. Um, we often look at this through an adult lens and it, it really leaves out the youth voices. Um, and so really having those opportunities to hear from our students, have their input um, on what needs to change in that, in that system. Um, and really, I, I'm so connected right now to the word connected this, like how do we just help our students all feel connected in their learning? Um, Cause they're, they're in this space together um, and we want all those positive outcomes. And so really being able to hear what they say. And I, I think a big part of that is just how do we connect with the material and how do we connect with each other? So I'm gonna hand it over to Chris now. Thank you. Um... Hi everyone. Um, oh wow, I am so I'm so glad to be here and for this conversation uh, to be happening. Um, I helped to put together the agenda on this and gave myself five minutes to go through uh, like a bunch of slides. So I'm going to talk kind of fast um, and hopefully. Um, oh no, I should I should not hit me. Okay. Uh -huh. uh. Yes, uh, so you can see uh, the presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit fast, but you will get the slides um, at the end of this. So uh, I did want to say I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Future of Sex Ed Partners, which includes Advocates for Youth, Answer, and SECUS. Um, and this presentation um, is to share out the, re the results from the February 2021 Future of Sex Ed Research Convening. Uh, we are putting out, uh, we'll be releasing uh, what we're calling the Future of Sex Ed Research Agenda, a call to action tomorrow. Um, it is available now on our, the FOSSI website. Um, and so this presentation is just to talk about some of the findings and recommendations from that event. Um, so if you can hang on this slide. Um, you know, the main point of all of this is that we know that sex ed does so much more uh, than just help teenagers prevent unplanned pregnancy. And, you know, as Shadeen mentioned, right, with uh, reproductive rights, sex ed, LGBTQ youth, and inclusive educational programs um, increasingly coming under attack, uh, this is a call to action to academics, researchers, and government to really help step up in collecting data that can help the general public understand the broadest benefits of sex education and why it's so important that we are inclusive and fact-based um, in it. Uh, next slide. Next slide. The findings from the event focus on highlighting the results found in the three decades of research, the case for comprehensive sex education. Uh, this was a comprehensive literature review looking at um, indicators uh, that support the national sex ed standards. Um, you can see these main outcomes here, uh, but we really want to develop more, uh, more comprehensive nationally representative data on sex ed programs and outcomes that can relate to the appreciation of sexual diversity, uh, gender diversity, dating and interpersonal violence prevention, childhood sexual abuse prevention, promotion of healthy relationship skills, particularly around learning of consent, social emotional learning benefits, and media liter literacy related to uh, understanding explicit content uh, when exposed to it. Next slide. And we know that collecting this data uh, would be happening now if there weren't institutional barriers. And so part of the conversation was what are those barriers and what are some ways that we can try to address and overcome them? 
Um, and so some of the barriers that were identified by the participants were that, you know, research outside of academia goes unrecognized. There's a lack of racial diversity amongst both educators and researchers that can have detrimental impact on um, survey results or study results. Um, that researchers in particular experience difficulty obtaining institutional review board or IRB approvals. Um, and that there is a minimal of longitudinal data that can follow young people and their attitudes and behaviors over time. Next slide. These are just some of the highlighted barriers identified. Um, and so based off of the, these conversations, we asked participants to brainstorm some recommendations. How could we address some of these barriers? Where could we try to move the needle forward? Um, and so we did identify recommendations for some of the key players uh, in this. Uh, so the first is federal government, uh, looking at the Biden administration, and I hope that we have a lot of um, colleagues and friends uh, in the audience uh, taking notes. Um, but we would love to see a national repository of adolescent sexual health data created um, and that the government really helped to lead on expanding data measures to include exposure, risk factors, protection factors related to adolescent sexual violence and abuse. Uh, attitude and behavior changes related to accepting of sexual and gender diversity, adoption of healthy relationship skills like consent and refusal, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, access to and need for sexual health services, and uh, helping to take the lead on um, creating new standards for research beyond the classic IRB or randomized controlled tests so that researchers can, um, you know, uh, take action in adapting and adopting um, additional data measures. Um, so one of the presentations uh, that will come after this is um, technical guidance from UNESCO that offers a way forward in doing that. Um, I think uh, next slide. Uh, there. There are some recommendations around uh, the YRBS. Uh, we know that that is one of the most uh, comprehensive sources that everyone looks to right now. Um, so, you know, is there a way to, you know, um, include program surveillance of receipt and content quality uh, impact and consequences for young people that um, are surveyed through this data? Um, can the YRBS data be linked to the school health profile so there's better integration and information um, uh, and analysis of the results uh, for administration and student experience? Um, collecting uh, data, oh, and then broadly looking at how do we collect data on implementation and adequacy of instruction and any gaps in curriculum? Um, and then uh, lastly, a measure of program tone, whether the instruction is perceived as negative or positive, which can have um, uh, provide information related to topic exposure and efficacy. Next slide. For funders, um, there is a major role that you can play in helping to fund projects that support expanding research methodologies and practices. Uh, there's also a tremendous role that can be played in funding research that focuses on adolescent sexual health needs and outcomes, particularly for our most vulnerable youth, students with disabilities, BIPOC youth, and LGBTQ plus youth. And I think that that would help to support and provide additional backing for um, the results that Dr. Ethier spoke to earlier. Um, next slide. And then finally, for those of you who, in, who are in the audience who are in the practice of developing research and studying all of these things, um, we would like for you to start uh, applying the UNESCO technical guidance now uh, to improve uh, research and study outcomes to, uh, uh, um, to help us start to collect this data. Um, and uh, there will be conversation about how you can do so in the next session. So I'm trying to both like make the plug of why all of this is important, why it's so necessary, and here uh, are some strategies uh, coming up next on how you can do so. Uh, but make sure that you're conducting research with that intersectional framework, really thinking about the connections to community partners and, uh, and the students uh, whose lived experiences are most likely to be left out of existing programs. Uh, and then to work and include and recognize those community needs within the research process so that there is also the benefit to the community um, in participating um, 
uh, fully within uh, the study. Uh, final slide. Okay. Uh, hopefully I did this okay. Whew. Uh, we cannot afford for human sexuality research to remain in academia where the general public is left out of the loop in understanding the broad and important benefits of CSC. Um, parents want to do right by their kids and we need to help connect them to the data and the evidence that shows how dramatically important it is for academic uh, mental health, sexual health and uh, relationship, healthy relationship benefits for young people. So I'm going to end there so that we can um, turn it to audience Q&A. Oh, there was so much great, great data there. I'm going to amplify some of the questions that showed up uh, in the Q and A. For folks who had asked questions about um, the slides, slides will be sent out to you following this presentation. So don't you worry, you have an opportunity to <laughs> re-digest this all over again. Um, this first question I think is directed to Dr. E here. Uh, the question is, have you found that using more inclusive and expansive language in survey questions and response options has affected the quality of your data gathering or your ability to obtain a higher amount of participation? That's a great question. And I think there was also another question in the chat about whether we included a question on gender identity um, uh, uh, or, or non-binary gender. So let me answer both of those at the same time because I think they're related. Um, for this survey, we were not able to include um, a question on gender identity. We do have a question um, that we've been using in some of our state data um, that will be included on future national surveys, but um, the science behind that question wasn't quite done yet in time for this survey. Um, I think for us, you know, uh, federal surveillance is difficult. Um, and, um, and so we, I, I feel like, um, identity is changing faster than we can develop changes, than, than we can develop questions to address it. And so we're, we're using this kind of combination of we have our surveillance, which is very standardized and, um, you know, kind of, and has to have particular formats. Um, and then we try to do also qualitative data collection, not on the same scale, but in smaller studies so that we can really kind of understand more of the lived experience. So we've done a really um, nice set of um, studies um, for among transgender young people um, uh, and gender non-binary young people that really get that more about their lived experience that we just really can't capture in kind of this very high level surveillance data. So I think what that means for us is that we need data kind of at all of those levels to really be able to kind of understand what's happening. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make time for two more. This first one is a higher level question. So I would love if anyone has an answer on the panel uh, to hop into it. Um, this question is what are considered or what would you consider quality sex ed curricula per the CDC's approach to school based uh, primary prevention? What efforts are being made to expand what types of curricula are considered quality? I can answer from CDC's perspective, Chris or Sam, unless you, unless one of y'all want to jump in. There, there are there are some really really wonderful um, kind of classroom based curriculum that are out there and available that are inclusive do a really wonderful job, um, and and that changes you know those 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 um, curriculums change over time they get better over time, um, so what we've done rather than identify like really specific curriculum that we want schools to use we created a tool called the Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool. And what that does is, and we just updated it um, and, and moved into the 20th century and it's now available online as opposed to like a big tome that you had to print out. Um, we just did that last summer and made sure that we added um, a lot of, um, uh, of kind of information on inclusivity to the new tool. But what we do is we then encourage our, um, we encourage school districts, we require the school districts that we fund to use that tool to then make sure that it's curriculum that lives up to standards, that it has evidence of effectiveness, that it does all of the things that you, that we 
would expect a curriculum to do. So that rather than recommending any individual curriculum, we are teaching districts how to um, kind of go through um, go through some decision making and go through some analysis to see whether or not the curriculum both fulfills their needs, but is also of high quality. Um, and we find that that's a much better way than kind of recommending any specific curriculum. Mm, thank you. So let's do one more really quickly before we jump into our next segment. Um, and thank you everyone who has been submitting questions. We won't have time for all of them, um, but the one that we will um, answer here now is, what can we do uh, as individuals to help our communities with providing access to mm -hmm. these forms of comprehensive sex education and care when it isn't necessarily accessible in our areas? I will. I mean, everyone lives in a school district, right? Um, I would educate yourselves as much as you can about all of the things that schools can do to support the health and well being of their students, all of their students, and particularly their most vulnerable students, and show up in the places where those decisions are made and make sure that you are contributing to that conversation. Um, I think we're hearing lots of voices um, in the rooms where decisions are made about schools, but I don't think they're always the, the complete set of voices. So it is information that you can take from this webinar. You can educate yourself um, in a variety of different ways about what your schools should be doing um, to really support students and get in there and get involved in that conversation. Yeah, I just want to respond to that. Um, I think that, you know, Dr. Ethier is exactly right. Um, there, CECAS has a community action toolkit. It has, um, you know, uh, focused information for students, for parents, for digital uh, activation. Uh, but it's it, it really is like, you know, take the first step in learning what's happening in your uh, community and then, uh, you know, get involved. Um, there, I know that a lot of partner organizations are start, starting to develop toolkits and resources for folks that provide information, messaging, guidance, support for um, folks that find themselves in communities where uh, this conversation is happening. And, you know, I think that you can always turn to Advocates for Youth has a number of free resources. Their three R's curriculum is freely available online and has been translated into um, different languages. Um, the AMAZE project that Advocates for Youth and ANSWER um, have um, video content for um, young people, for adolescents, for parents to navigate these questions. And so, you know, seek out those resources where, you know, you can, um, you know, uh, provide free offerings, um, but certainly get involved and let's be the majority who believe that comprehensive sex education is a valuable um, skill set for young people to have. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Sam? Yeah, I think my colleague said it best. Um, yeah. Perfect. Oh, well, I think the word of the first half, if we were to sum it, is connectedness. I mean, as a as an organizing through line, you know, it, one of the takeaways uh, for me from what I have heard so far, you know, is that these, in order to increase connect connectedness, this has to exist at the level of the learning environment, at the level of policy, at the level of research, particularly inclusive research. We need to be thinking about intersectional research and program implementation because folks, especially the young people that we are hoping to serve, need to be fully included throughout this process. And so as we come together, I'm really excited by the amount of collaboration that's happening also in the chat as we're talking about desire for research. So thank you so much to our panel uh, for starting us off in this conversation, for giving us calls to action, for sharing with us what you have learned about meaningful in, uh, intervention uh, and how it exists, not just at the level of uh, knowledge or information sharing, but really in a changing structure, in creating new policies, in the shifting of our attitudes and in our reimagining of our cultures beyond the existing barriers. 
So for folks who have further questions about any of the organizations, any of the speakers, please reach out to them directly. And we are going to move into the next piece of our conversation today. Hopefully you are feeling inspired and motivated towards action, especially those of you who are on the ground with youth, those of you who are hungry for more research to do, uh, and all of you who have access to uh, funding resources. So I want you to harness those emotions, harness that energy, and uh, join us as we tune into the next piece of our conversation all together. This second session that we are sharing today is about looking towards the future, right? particularly measures and design for the future. I would like to introduce our panelists. So first is Arushi Singh, who is a program specialist with the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which you would likely know as UNESCO. Arushi works uh, in UNESCO's section of health and education on comprehensive sexuality education, particularly examining best practices on building supports for CSE, fostering a global community of practice on CSE, and advancing the research agenda on CSE. Previously, she worked for IPPF, uh, Amnesty, and the Commonwealth. Your second panelist uh, is Justin Citron, an associate professor in the Center for Human Sexuality Studies and the director of the Interdisciplinary Sexuality Research Collaborative at Widener University. He is also the president-elect for the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality, which we know as Quad S. Justin's work focuses on culturally responsive sexuality education programming, training at the intersection of anti-racism and sexual and gender identity, and also applying justice and rights frameworks to community-focused research and programming. And your third panelist for this segment is Carlos E. Rodriguez Diaz, who is an associate professor of prevention and community health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. He is also the president of Quad S and is a community health scientist with nearly two decades of experience practicing public health and uh, conducting community-centered research in Puerto Rico and the United States of America, as well as the Caribbean region. His work has focused on sexual health promotion, access to primary health care for LGBTQ plus populations, HIV prevention and care, and also the health equity, or and, and also creating health equity through actions on the social determinants of health. So thank you all for being here. I will now turn it over to our panel. Thank you so much, uh, Shireen, and hello everyone. It's very nice to log in here. It's uh, I'm in Paris and it's nearly 10 p.m. So I hope I stay awake. <laughs> um, so we, as, as we started with this entire session, um, we spoke about the fact that in Feb 21, there was this convening and Chris kindly uh, shared the kind of results from that. So in fact, this evidence gaps and research needs in CSE technical brief was um, in progress at the time. So I did share some preliminary findings. Uh, it's since been published. So I'll just sort of uh, share with you some top line ideas that it uh, has and ways in which that we have been operationalizing it uh, and perhaps some uh, further ideas for you to operationalize. So Michelle, if you could move to the next slide. Essentially, uh, you know, we understand and know that comprehensive sexuality education is a multi-component program and therefore research really needs to go beyond traditional health outcomes to really be looking at this wide array and a range of um, aspects uh, that CSC uh, hits upon. We also need a lot more information, evidence, and guidance on curriculum content, on teacher preparation, and minimum packages in low resource settings where not everything is possible and you can't have like the 100% best program ever. Um, and of course, we need diverse research methods because you can't just, you know, have only quantitative or only qualitative or only randomized control trials or whatever it is that you're looking at to really look at this huge range of outcomes related not only to health, but even education, gender, 
as well as the process, the delivery, you know, what, it, what constitutes effective delivery of this multi-component program. And there's certainly a big call for very localized and diverse types of evidence for, for localized policy and program and funding decisions to be made. Uh, which means that uh, often, you know, and, and Chris already summarized this, often research tends to happen uh, in particular contexts, in high-income countries, around sexuality education um, uh, studies, and we need more diverse and contexts. And alongside that, we need more participatory and qualitative research that includes young people and their perspectives. So these are sort of some of the key messages. Thank you. Uh, some of the recommendations I'm summarizing here, the technical brief is available for you online on the UNESCO website to read through and really chew over. Uh, we looked at uh, five key kind of uh, areas for research, outcomes and effectiveness of CAC. And I think one of the main things that came out there was really to test a holistic model for CAC. To, to be able to examine outcomes and teaching approaches and intermediate variables that affect the outcomes, etc. Um, it's also really, as I already said, and everyone else has been saying about multiple outcomes, health and social, including, for example, equitable interpersonal relationships, building self-efficacy, understanding of gender, understanding of consent and violence, and to examine the impact of the socio-ecological context of young people on the effectiveness of the CSC that they are receiving. When it comes to curriculum content, there's a great need and a call for really understanding what does age-appropriate content mean, uh, especially because contexts are so different and, you know, uh, a seven-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old in different countries, in different localities, from different races, as we saw from the CDC um, uh, data as well, of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity or expression are different. And so really when we say age appropriate, what does that mean? <laughs> and especially for the younger ages, because uh, that's, that's the sort of and I'm speaking here from a very global kind of angle. Those are the, yeah, the ages that tend to get missed out. You know, it's easier to talk about sexuality education with a 15 year old typically than perhaps with an eight year old. Um, there's, a, there's also a, a need to understand newly emerging sexual risks, digital sexting, you know, all of those issues that we know. Uh, and of course, as uh, again, as we saw through the CBC uh, research, you know, pandemics and school closures and what does that mean and what does it um, uh, mean for sexuality education and how to deliver it. Uh, we need to also understand levers and shared values for content that tends to get dropped. This is typically content that is seen as sensitive or uh, culturally irrelevant sometimes, uh, inappropriate. And what is it, how do we, how can we make sure that, that this kind of content uh, resonates with local needs? Because we know young people want it uh, and they need it, but how do we make sure that teachers and parents and communities um, are on board with it as well? What, what works actually to effectively include CSC into curricula? Um, how do you, should you have, you know, uh, a separate curriculum should it be integrated and mainstream throughout all the other topics, for example, these are some of the questions. And of course, um, context responsive and inclusive curricula. Uh, what does that mean? How do you get go about it? And which is why, again, this need for very localized studies is quite important as well. Um, when it comes to delivery, it's about accountability for delivery and monitoring of sexuality education. And this typically falls between the cracks in many countries because is it the health ministry's job to be providing sexuality education? Is it the education ministry's job to be providing sexuality education? Is it the gender ministry's job to be monitoring it? So it, you know, it tends to fall between the cracks. So we need to understand what is the best um, framework for accountability. And linked to that, what are the indicators for quality sexuality education? Much like the question that came up in the previous session, um, uh, and what kinds of scale-up mechanisms work in different contexts. 
And again, effective delivery methods. So this is a little bit even linked to the curriculum uh, question about how do you effectively include CSE into curricula and how do you effectively deliver it? What are the optimum teaching hours? When do we know? Is it going to be, is it like 60 hours and then your ideas about consent have changed? Is that, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, what are the, what kinds of pedagogy work best in different contexts? And how do we really understand learner-centered approaches? You know, how do we prepare teachers for all of this? Um, distance learning, again, as I said, for example, during the pandemic, there were several examples that we were aware of uh, where some countries or some ministries of education continue to provide sexuality education either online, through television, uh, through radio, uh, et cetera. So, you know, understanding what that means, how easy or difficult it is, and of course, really looking at diverse learners and diverse settings, because I don't, as we've heard, the, there is no silver bullet and not one thing works for everybody. And finally, in this section of recommendations around building support and addressing resistance for CSE, uh, is how do we effectively build support with various different stakeholders? So what does it mean when you're talking to a policymaker, when you're talking to a parent or a teacher? Um, and really, what are the emotional and values-based levers for messaging? Because I think, at least uh, within the UN and internationally amongst uh, organizations that are providing sexuality education, uh, having seen the work of the counter movement against sexual rights, against uh, human rights and against providing sexuality education to young people, they've kind of uh, picked up these emotional um, uh, messages that resonate with parents a lot. Oh, they're sexualizing young people, you know. <laughs> and how do we overturn those narratives and reclaim the concept of family for ourselves to say that actually sexuality education, we know this and we have evidence for this, that a good sexuality education program involves families, ensures that parents, teachers, community members are engaged within uh, the program and are very much a part of providing this sexuality education alongside teachers um, and, and pre-educators. So, so these are the recommendations related to sort of sexuality education, delivery, content, outcomes, et cetera. Uh, and then the final uh, one, if Michelle, you would shift to the next slide, is around research methodologies. And again, Christine uh, kindly summarized this. Um, so I'm just gonna be quite quick. It's about, using more theory-driven approaches. It's about being interdisciplinary, long-term effects. And I've seen in the chat, some people have been talking about that. It seems perhaps some long-term uh, uh, research has been going on, which we just need more of it around the world. Um, again, about heterogeneous groups and settings, looking at diversity uh, of all kinds, um, participatory, localized, and small scale also, mixed methods, and really including gray literature because there's so much good work that's happening through uh, NGOs, uh, through out of school work across the world, where especially where there is not a, a national uh, sexuality education um, uh, curriculum in place, and it needs to be looked at, captured, and included in the evidence and the and the knowledge that we have around sexuality education and what works. So yes, thank you. Moving on, uh, this is a con after our technical brief was published, uh, Kovston and Van Rewijk uh, published this conceptual framework for adolescent sexual well-being. And I'm just bringing it up here because I really like it personally. <laughs> and uh, okay, uh, and I just want to say that it's possible to use this to really uh, examine and understand uh, how you can go about doing, answering some of the questions basically that we bring up in the technical brief. So if you move on to the next slide, um, Michelle, uh, you'll see that you, know, you could look at the socio-ecological, the underlying principles, it looks at the socio-ecological context, it's really using a human rights and gender transformative approach is moving away from a risk-based approach to really a very sex positive and pleasure inclusive approach to adolescent sexuality and models theories of empowerment uh, while examining the sort of reciprocal and complex nature of sexuality development. And then there's a list of key competencies that they have, 
which I think relates so closely to what we should aim for with sexuality education and which could be examined. And finally, if you move on, uh, Michelle. Thanks. So some of the, these are just examples of what we are doing at UNESCO. We, we've been engaging in research around building support and addressing resistance to CSE. We have just coming up to uh, uh, this year, we've, we've done a study on inclusive sexuality education. We've looked at school-based sexuality education that is inclusive of sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. And uh, we're framing it within curricula that are SOGI protective, curricula that are SOGI sensitive and curricula that are SOGI transformative. And we have about 10 case studies from around the world. The Global Partnership Forum on CSE, of which Advocates for Youth is also a member, uh, has been doing a survey amongst its members, uh, which are about 63 member organizations on the latest and ongoing studies and evaluations. We'll be sharing that with you. And on the sort of, uh, these are not yet started, the CSE outcomes and youth perspectives. So we're really gonna be doing a multi-country study up to six countries of short-term and intermediate learning and attitudinal and behavioral outcomes of sexuality education programs. And we want to look at young people's perspectives um, on, uh, on sexuality education. And that really is it from me. Sorry for rushing through, but uh, happy to have a conversation about any of the things that I've shared. So thank you, Michelle. I think you were waiting for the slides. The slides, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Justin Citron, and I am here as a representative of Quad S as the president elect, but wanted to kind of bring to this table a way of taking a lot of what we've been talking about of creating these fantastic programs for youth and thinking about what does it look like when we implement sexuality education in ways that really centers the people for whom it's designed. Next slide. Community-based participatory research is one of the most valuable research approaches when it comes to the design and development of programming that really centers the community for whom the programs are created. Next slide. The key components of a CBPR conceptual model are that we have to think about the context. Where is the research happening? For whom is the research being done? And are we looking to the many different facets of communities for the research questions themselves, for the problems that we're looking to discover and solve? Next. Who are the people? How are we partnering with local community, their individual characteristics, the core relationships of those places, the different partnering agencies and organizations that make those communities thrive and that bring the resources to the table. Next. And then we begin to think about intervention and research to develop or to understand the impact of the interventions we're designing. We have to really think about two parts. We're so often focused because we're doing educational program on the learning outcomes, what people are walking away with, that we fail sometimes to really think about the process of learning. So much of what folks have talked about today, student connectedness, students experience of belonging, feeling like they're centered in the curriculum. That has to do with the process through which curricula are designed and the ways those uh, curricula then center the people who are part of the target audience for those programs. Next. And when we're thinking about CBPR, this, or we're thinking about our research around sexuality education this way, our outcomes then become about the process of the development of programming, the ways in which we went through the processes and the collaborations to get there, and also looking more long term, not just on the immediate outcomes of programs, but also what's the impact of those programs over time? What is the impact of those programs over uh, in society at large? Next. Carlos? 
So I know that I'm between uh, our presentation and uh, an excellent Q&A that I'm pretty sure we're gonna have. So uh, in the next few minutes, I am going to share with you the implementation of research that informed the practice of sexuality education using uh, a community-based participatory approach. Next. First, um, as uh, Justin just mentioned, we need to base our work uh, according to the needs of the community. And for a project that I recently uh, work in, um, we were developing a sexuality uh, education tool to reduce HIV risks among uh, young sexual uh, minority men. And the project was meant to uh, follow a practice or a tool that could be transfer to the real world and relatively fast. Uh, we also aim to include um, Spanish speaking uh, young men. So we were dealing with very um, specific issues and we needed the um, feedback of our community partners. So we conducted several um, interviews and meetings with community advisory boards. And we also created a youth advisory board and we met through Facebook or other apps to get their feedback as we were developing the intervention. Next. Um, we also use the current knowledge uh, based on science on how to develop an app or a e-health tool that could resonate with the needs but also the um, technology and resources that the um, target population had. And here I'm sharing with you some of the scientific work that is available to inform this kind of intervention. And in fact, I, I believe that Dr. Lee, who's been doing an excellent work in implementation science in this kind of work is in the audience today. And um, he is one of the leaders of this pro in this project informing the development of the intervention by also understanding the implementation of the project, not only doing research, but also what are we gonna do with this once we prove evidence, we have evidence that the intervention works. Next. Um, as we have mentioned, we need to improve the measures. And one of the challenges that we have uh, with measures is the, um, language that we use. And uh, as part of this project, I led the cultural adaptation of the different measures that we use, not only to um, uh, assess the effect effectiveness of the intervention and uh, the behavioral changes that we were seeing in our participants, but also uh, the content itself, what, it was, what the participants were using because the content was available in English and Spanish. So we developed what we call PACA, uh, which is a participatory approach uh, to conduct culturally appropriate um, adaptations. Um, this is a manuscript that hopefully will be available by the end of this year, in which we describe how we use the community, how we work with the community and the scientists uh, and educators behind the, the tools to develop the materials and adapt uh, the content. Here in, in the illustration, I'm sorry, if we can go back briefly. This, uh, this is an illustration of something that we developed for the app. So this is an HIV risk calculator. And um, as you can see, we use emojis where the participants can choose. Uh, and then it's like a calculator where we can um, share or the, the app will share with the participant the level of risk that they have for STI or HIV. Next. One of the issues that we have faced uh, as we develop research and uh, try to use the best practices in research uh, in sexuality education and with youth is the so-called protection of the participants. And we have faced uh, challenges with the approval of uh, protocols to conduct research with this population, the issues of consent, who's consenting for what, and the parental consent. Next. So just briefly, I'm sharing with you that we have the science that inform that we need to change how we approve protocols to include youth because otherwise IRB and, and panels that uh, are meant to protect the participation of human subjects in research are being a um, uh, stumbling block in, and, uh, and are blocking our ability to do the research that can inform changes uh, in sexuality education. 
Um, research has also evidenced that most adults' parents do not know what's going on out there uh, in the uh, in the world, virtually or in the classrooms or other sources that can be available of sex education. So if the parents don't know, they are also interested in in the in the development of uh, resources that are good for their kids and often might not be even interested. So the idea that parents are in control and absolute control of the consent of, uh, of an adolescent uh, or youth um, or, or young um, people, uh, it, it could be misunderstood. Um, and next, we have done research in which parents are basically saying, um, you know, I want my, my, my kids to participate in research that helps them. No, if it doesn't harm them, we want the research to be available. And the evidence also suggests that um, um, uh, adolescents engage more in sexuality research when the parents are not involved, when they don't have to provide any con kind of consent because they feel that they can provide much more personal information that is relevant as we conduct uh, research and prove the evidence of different interventions. So lastly, I want to share uh, what this uh, project was. Um, this, is a, uh, this was a project funded by the National Institutes of Health uh, for around six years. So we just finished collecting data earlier this year. And it was a pragmatic trial of an, an intervention. Uh, the PI was Dr. Mutansky at Northwestern University in Chicago. And uh, this is Oli. Um, this was the... Um, character that was throughout the app um, uh, and was developed and named by um, some of the community partners and participants uh, alike. Next. So um, I, this is a, a, an illustration of how the research and the intervention looks like. And I'm not going to get into the details because at Smart Design, uh, not Smart the our app, but this, a Smart Design is an acronym for uh, a kind of design that basically help us uh, randomizing participants in in different ways so we can answer different questions. And what is important about the the intervention and this design is that um, participants get the level of intervention that they need. So uh, our design included three, and, and our intervention included the adaptation of three different um, evidence-based interventions. One was based on sexuality education. The other one is HIV prevention. And the third one is a more intensive HIV and um, sexuality risk uh, intervention. But participants move through the application uh, and they use whatever they needed based on the responses to our questions that were for to collect data, but also to help the participant to move through the app. Next. This is an example of the content that we uh, included in the Smart Sex Ed. Um, as you can see, this is basic sexuality education, but it was queered. Um, we included information that was relevant for uh, the participants in their language, and uh, it was very current. Uh, as uh, during the intervention uh, prep, pre-exposure prophylaxis was approved for adolescents. So we were able to adapt the content uh, to include it in the uh, section three on HIV prevention uh, methods. Next, this is an example of SMART Quad Squad, uh, which was the second intervention. And to, uh, this intervention was more focused on HIV prevention and it's, it was more interactive. Uh, we recorded videos uh, in which we have characters that uh, were or resemble uh, the um, target audience and they interacted and had to make decisions. So the participants uh, interacted virtually uh, by answering questions and with the answers, they will get more information. Um, so it was, it was fantastic uh, to have the opportunity to, to study the feasibility of doing this. Lastly, I want to show um, just some of the images that illustrate the work that we did in order to reach out to um, our audience. Um, the information was made available in English and Spanish, and yes, sign language, because the app also had subtitles. And we learned in the process that was also useful for people who, had, uh, who needed um, that resource. And, um, and again, it all these images 
um, responded to the feedback that we got from um, our community. And now we are analyzing data and hopefully we will demonstrate that this project, this intervention is feasible. And the next step will be to translate um, this from a research environment to the real world and support um, either schools, uh, community-based organizations or other uh, organizations that could be interested in adapting um, and adopting this uh, resource for uh, different audiences. So with that, um, I say thank you. And I just realized that I had my camera off throughout the whole presentation. So I am sorry for that. Um, but luckily um, you had a set of good slides. So thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the invitation and I hope that we get the opportunity to answer your questions. Hmm. Thank you so much uh, to our second half panel. To make sure that we have an opportunity to dive into the questions, I'm going to ask them all at once. Uh, if that is okay with you. Um, and you can choose sort of how <laughs> you would like to respond to any of these. I'm gonna um, open them up to the entire panel um, and I'm gonna loop them together. I will try not to speak too quickly so that you can hear the questions. And then I will also, as you're answering, prompt them in the chat if it helps you to see questions as you're answering them. Uh, so the first uh, is, if we work in a school district setting, how would you recommend getting our district involved in ongoing research? So the second part of that question is how can districts find partners uh, with researchers who are looking at uh, multiple CSE outcomes? But that first question largely is about how, how can folks get involved, get their organizations involved with ongoing research? And then the second question that I'd like to pose uh, to you panel uh, is can you speak to the funding organizations um, that are either already involved in this or the kind of funding that would support your work? And so I open it up to you. So I can take a piece of this. So I think uh, Chris had mentioned the need for the repository, like a data repository, but also what we're really lacking is a network of sexuality education researchers in the country who work together across um, school district areas, states, universities. Many of us find our way to the field of sexuality education from a specific perspective, whether that's public health, public education, um, child and adolescent development. And we need to do more to work together as sexuality education researchers. The other piece of it is so often because this research is happening at governmental agencies or at universities, we're often not necessarily working with our most local communities. And so one of the nice things about CBPR and some examples Carlos gave um, and some of the things um, Arushi spoke to is that we just really need to be more mindful of like who's really right next to us. And I think it's for parents and folks working with school districts, the the gatekeeping and the barrier to access those places for those of us outside of the local community is hard. And so the more that um, schools can partner with us as researchers and as, as academic institutions, as governmental agencies, the more likely we'll get access because it's one thing to be invited in and another thing to be asked or to, to ask to be invited in. And so I would just say, you know, the more folks on the ground want for us involved, the more we can do that more easily. Um, and we've got to increase our communication and those capacities that are beyond the traditional way of thinking about our impact and really thinking about leveraging community networks and community relationships, because that's where the heart of all this is in the end. I echo what Justin just said, um, and I guess I can answer the question about funding resources for research and sexuality education. Um, first of all, if there is a health outcome, I mean, sexuality education, we have multiple health outcomes. Uh, the National Institute of Health is a source of um, funding that many of us scientists, researchers have used to answer questions um, to improve sexuality education. Um, one of the challenges that we have uh, though using funding from NIH is that we need to come up with evidence uh, to test interventions and often the process to get the funding and then implement the research can take too long. 
the evidence suggests that in order to have a, an intervention with, uh, with um, uh, evidence of effectiveness can take almost a decade uh, from collecting data that describe the problem to developing the intervention and testing the intervention with the, proper, with the appropriate um, uh, methodology. Uh, but there are other uh, sources of funding. So for example, uh, the, the private sector sometimes if, have been interested in improving some outcomes that are associated with sexuality education, as well as uh, foundations. Um, so it's a matter, I'll, I'll be honest, to be very creative in how we connect uh, the outcomes uh, that might be the, the goal of certain funders with sexuality education. I would say that if you have the entry and the support of the population or community that you're working with, that's an asset when applying for funding. Rishi, was there anything else that you would like to add before we close here? No, thank you so much. I mean, uh, the questions were kind of US specific, but I would just like to say from a global perspective uh, that, you know, I agree completely with what Justin was saying. We all need to band together, build a community of researchers and work together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panel and thank you to all of you who are tuning in, whether you're here with us live or joining us from Tomorrowland. Uh, we are so, so glad that you participated in this conversation. I want to amplify you know, some of these key talking points around collaboration, around community partnership, around inclusivity, around uh, seeing who is to our right and our left as we work towards this larger shared goal. So this time has been so full, so robust. And so I hope all of you found this to be meaningful. I hope that there are takeaways and applications to all of your work um, and that you can start to apply some of these suggestions and recommendations for the benefit uh, of the future of sexual health education, particularly for young people. So this concludes our event for today. I want to say thank you also to our partnering organizations. I'm here on behalf of ASEC. Uh, Adv Advocates for Youth, Answer, Sikas, and Quares. Thank you to all of our participating speakers, uh, Dr. Ethier from DASH, Arusi Singh from UNESCO, and Samantha King from CHOP. Uh, and thank you all again for your attendance. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. See you all again very soon, I hope. <laughs>